Okay, good morning everyone. My name is uh, Ronald Luyten. Um, my last name is very hard to pronounce for most people. My mother tells me I can't pronounce it correctly myself anymore. <laughs> so just call me Ronald, okay? My correlator actually only has a, a positive signal when you call me Ronald. So the American way of doing Ron or Ronnie, you will have no effect. Okay, so I work at the IBM Zurich Research Lab and at IBM Research we are uh, preparing the roadmap for uh, what the company should be doing in like five years, right? So we're not doing development, we're doing research. So um, Bill, for some reason that I don't understand, invited me to come here and talk about uh, large layer two networks. And so I, I need to make a small modification to the title if I can make this thing work, right? So actually we should make large energy efficient layer two networks, right? And I actually thought I was going to give this as a, a keynote, but I seem to be in the middle of the session, so I didn't write the word. Now, um, I will not be giving you results on, uh, say, large level two networks that we're doing at this point, but I'm going to show you an argumentation of why this will become very, very important, okay? So I'll show you uh, some things that uh, have been on my mind in the past couple of uh, months. So we are in the middle of a huge disruption that is going on as we speak, okay? So we have a combination of rapidly changing technology and rapidly changing <coughs> workloads, right? So very, very soon, we're going to have more data that is going to be generated by devices than people, right? Now, the amount of keystrokes or you know, starts that a uh, person can do is limited, but once we start to instrument the planet with sensors all around to do better management of our environment, that this amount of data is going to be generated is going to be much, much larger because we can deploy devices much more quickly than we can create new people. Um, so some of you may think that uh, this, uh, this smarter thing, this smarter planet thing from IBM is just another buzzword and you know, you'll, you can forget about this. I mean, uh, everybody, uh, every company has uh, you know, marketing things going on, etc. But um, the smarter planet actually is a, is a really uh, well thought through business model that IBM is executing, right? Uh, this is not a buzzword, there is real business behind this. And <clears throat> uh, some of you are probably quite aware that, you know, the data center network workloads are changing through all of these new things that are coming, right? I mean, YouTube caused a significant difference on the data, uh, sort of the traffic patterns on the, on the internet, and uh, these new things such as Twitter, Amazon, and these mobile devices, right? Um, in the previous, uh, in the morning we had heard somebody talking about, you know, people want to uh, watch TV on their mobile devices. Think about what does that, okay? And then there is this, uh, this, uh, this trend which I call the, the microserver technology that is emerging right now. Um, there are three architectures that are really interesting, uh, the ARM, the PowerPC and the x86. And you may think of the microserver as something that is pretty uninteresting because it can just you know, run a little bit of an application on your, on your cell phone and discard this for anything that looks like interesting in your data center. But these companies, they're building stuff that is pretty interesting. I mean, four core devices are available, eight core devices are available today. You can buy them and they're not that expensive. I mean, eight cores running each at two gigahertz is quite a uh, powerful compute platform. Now, most people think that you know the microservers are really interesting because they're low power designed for the cores, okay? That is the wrong way to think about this. The right way to think about this is the strength of the microserver is the system on the chip design. They're very tightly integrated, right? So a microserver, you add DRAM and you add the wires to a switch and, okay, you need a, a flash uh, memory so you can boot the device, but you're done. You can run stuff. 
and you can run real stuff. You can run Ubuntu, Linux. Okay. So the next thing uh, that is coinciding is we have new memory technologies that are emerging. So uh, Bernard uh, alluded to that yesterday. Uh, IBM calls it storage class memory. People see flash today. Flash is uh, pretty much unusable to do reliable stuff on. Um, but those new memory technologies uh, like phase change memory or um, uh, the SD RAMs that are coming, they're really uh, coming at, at the same time. And in, so my question to you guys, so who has looked at microservers lately? Please raise your hand. Who's, who's taken a look at this, okay? So just a handful of people, okay? So this is a thing that somebody gave into my hand exactly a year ago. And uh, so this is a little box that uh, is called a plug computer. It's about this big, so it's really small. And uh, there's an Ethernet that comes out. You have a USB and there's uh, an SD card reader. What I did was I installed uh, Linux Ubuntu on this. Uh, this is a hard drive that is a 1.8 inch, uh, 120 gig platter. Uh, this is just a device that measured the power. And so this thing runs <coughs> Ubuntu, the XFCE desktop, it runs Firefox, it runs Pigeon, it runs Apache web server. If you click on this link, you can actually see the page that is hosted at this device that sits on my desk at home. And here comes it. This thing uses 4.2 watts measured at 220 volt. So the energy bill to run this for an entire year is less than a co uh, the cost of a cup of coffee downtown Zurich. Think about that. Okay, so I see those microservers as a disruption in the in the classical sense of uh, Creighton Christensen, uh, who you see here, and um, so I see there's you know the sustaining innovation thing with uh, the the server class uh, CPUs and what you have in your laptops, whatnot, and this is a disruptive innovation. Uh, and see what uh, what Clayton writes here. So this is an example of a box done by C-Micro. Uh, I think it has 256 Atom CPU chips in there. So there's 512 cores. It runs 2.5 kilowatts for this entire box. Uh, has integrated Ethernet networking for the clustering and also the outside uh, connections are Ethernet. I don't know the topology details of this thing as it's not disclosed by C-Micro. Um, so my second question is, who has actually seen the keynote by Clayton Christensen at Supercomputing? Please raise your hand. Okay. So this thing is available online. Go to the Supercomputing website and spend one hour to look at this. This is one of the, uh, the really musty things that I think everybody uh, needs, to, needs to watch in this space. So there are five tremendously difficult walls that we face in the data center in the next couple of years. Um, those walls are also faced by the exascale, so people who've seen presentations won't be surprised by what's coming up here. The first wall is the energy wall, okay? So the amount of energy due to the, 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 the stopping of the scaling of Moore's law using the classical Denard scaling rules for CMOS, um, the energy is going to go up. Right, because we put more devices in, more cores, more CPUs, denser packaging, and um, this is not sustainable. Right, we're not going to spend more money on uh, the energy bill to run a data center than on the on the hardware. We have to do things in a more intelligent way, and we will do this in a more intelligent way. The second wall is the memory wall or the Van Neumann's bottleneck. You know that multi-core programming. Really, nobody that is coming out of university is taught how to uh, program multi-core CPUs. 99% uh, of the people coming out of uh, computer science know how to program in Java. Uh, it doesn't solve this problem, okay? Um, resilience. If we just put so much more stuff in a data center because, you know, the single thread uh, performance clock rate doesn't go up anymore. Resilience becomes a real issue. I won't go into detail here 
in the interest of time. And also, we need to fundamentally rethink our algorithms uh, given the capabilities of the hardware. Now, I'm a Dutch guy and I know how to bang my head through one wall, but after that I have a pretty big headache and there's five walls here, so I'm not that dumb, so I'm not gonna try and break these walls. We have to just find better solutions to circumvent them. Okay, now there's another keynote that uh, happened at Supercomputing last November, Bill Daly, and um, oh, I, I must say I had to make one, you know, uh, language improvement here. So I call this the high cost of data motion. Um, basically, this chart really goes at the heart of the issue that we have. So 99% of the energy that we spend in a data center is used in data motion. Okay? So this chart, you have to decode this a little bit, but what you see here is uh, there's a 64-bit uh, double precision floating point operation that goes on. The operation itself costs 20 picojoule, okay? Now, this is the cache that has the operands, and I cannot do this operation without operands, right? I need this data. So, getting the data out of this cache, and this is 256 bit, I need 2 times 64 bit in, is 50 picojoule. So, to get the operands is 25 picojoule. So, just reading this out of the cache, is already more than the actual uh, compute operation. But then I have these things connected by a bus. So suppose that this is the bus that's really uh, making a close connection to this uh, SRAM. You spend, again, it's 256 bit, you, you spend 13 picojoule to actually get that stuff there. But the cache only holds a copy of the data. The real data is I can't see my screen. The real data is in the in the DRAM, and I circled these things here. We're now changing orders of magnitude here, right? 500 picojoule to get across the chip boundary, and 16 nanojoule to actually do the read of this operand out of the DRAM, right? So we're spending significantly more energy in moving the operands than we are in doing the compute, okay? So the conclusion is, it's the data, stupid. Compute is a solved problem. We solved compute in the last millennium, really. Okay, now what we have done in my team is we've taken 45 nanometer implementations of an ARM running at one gigahertz, of a PowerPC core running at 1.2 gigahertz, and of a Atom so x86 core running at 1.6 gigahertz, all in 45 nanometer CMOS. We have compiled the same Linux kernel for all three. We have uh, only enabled one core for all of those cases, because the Atom is a dual core, and we have compiled benchmarks that we ran on all of these architectures, okay? Now here comes a really interesting conclusion. Energy per answer across those three ISAs is the same. There is no difference. Now, the Atom runs at 1.6 gigahertz, so it is done faster, it uses more power, but if you integrate the energy over time, energy per answer is the same. So, conclusion is, the ISA doesn't matter. So what does matter? Well, it's your lucky day, folks. You are no longer second-class citizen. The networking, moving the data around, becomes really key. And what becomes really key is how we put things together. It's the integration. So the um, microserver strength is that they integrate everything on one chip. You save the chip crossings and see how expensive those chip crossings are, right? Every time that you do that, you lose an incredible amount of energy. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm also delving into uh, the fundamentals of photonics. So there's a fantastic guy by the name of Professor Harm Doran. He also happens to be Dutch. It's a complete coincidence. Um, <coughs> And uh, he's a really critical thinker in this space. And what I've done together with him is a fundamental analysis based on the laws of physics 
without looking at particular implementation details, without looking at technology details to say, I have data that sits on a CMOS chip somewhere that needs to go to another CMOS chip somewhere else, and we're going to do the data motion over a photonic link. And the assumptions are we use directly modulated light, so directly modulated VIXEL, because that is the most energy efficient way to uh, do that conversion, and we use a pin diode for the detection. Now using the fundamental laws of physics, thermodynamics, we calculate the energy that is needed to do the conversion from the electronic to the photonic domain and, uh, and the way back. Then we have a couple of assumptions that we say we look at uh, two types of uh, wavelengths that we can do for the photonic choice, so 1550 nanometer and 850 nanometer, those are very well known wavelengths. And um, then we have uh, the assumption of having no loss at all in the optical domain, which is uh, a bottom line but not practical, or to say let's have 10 dB of loss in the optical domain. So typically you need two connectors, each, each connector loses 3 dB, and then you have some loss in the waveguide. So if you're talking a waveguide that connects two chips that sit on a carrier, so like an FR4 with an integrated waveguide, we have prototypes like that in our lab, then 4 dB for a distance of a couple of inches is, is a reasonable assumption. And then we made the assumption that we can engineer bit arrays in this. So uh, the, the bottom line here is uh, 10 to minus 9, or, or, and the top one is 10 to the 12th, right? And what you see is that the fundamental energy that you need per bit, A, it goes up with the bit rate. So this is kind of bad news, right? So when you run faster, the energy per bit goes up. Right? So the energy already goes up because you go faster, but it goes up faster double, right? And um, most of the energy is in fact spent in the conversion. And this is making no assumptions about PLLs or clock recovery or serialization, deserialization circuits. It is just losing, looking at the conversion from the electronic to the photonic domain and back. So if we only were to look at the, uh, the transport of data in the photonic domain, actually it would be here. It would be around one femtojoule per bit. And we're orders of magnitude higher. Now this is the absolute minimum. There is no design that can do better than this. Uh, practical designs are going to be order of magnitude or two orders of magnitude worse, right? But there's a couple of really interesting conclusions that you can draw to this, which is number one, to do photonics on chip, to go from one corner of the same chip to another corner on the same chip photonically is just a dumb idea. It's, I don't know why people do that stuff. Okay, So a couple of observations I'd like to make is that um, you know good old SMPs that have been around for a long long time they are here to stay for the classical workloads, right? But this is not a growth area. Right? Um, there's a new class of workloads that, are, that is coming up, as I just mentioned, and there's loads of uh, programmers and programming models that are coming up that will learn how to deal with non-SMP. Right? And so Hadoop MapReduce is what I see as a first of a new generation of methods that allow people to use this kind of infrastructure. Right now it is seen by many people as the hammer that you know will uh, fit any nail. The second thing was mentioned also a couple of times this morning and yesterday, big data is coming. Okay? Now big data does not fit in the cache. We're talking uh, databases in the order of petabytes and um, that stuff doesn't fit in the cache. There is no locality, right? And so I have to say that I am not completely agreeing with what, what Intel mentioned yesterday. Um, I don't believe in, in saying, you know, it's a programmer's uh, uh, task to make sure that the data becomes local and we can move everything, everything into the cache. Then we have a really high bandwidth from the cache to the cores and therefore having many cores on a chip makes sense. I just, I just don't subscribe to that. Um, so there is a limit to putting ever more cores on, uh, on a piece of silicon, right? As I mentioned, there's non-volatile memory types coming that allows us to store all of this big data into uh, non-platter uh, type, uh, so non-hard disk type uh, memories. And as I mentioned, 
the strength of the server is tight integration that gives significant power savings because of fewer chip crossings. So for these new workloads, um, given the fact that we have this energy and memory wall, uh, microservers are really an interesting choice. And what you notice is that the compute core is rapidly becoming a commodity. You can buy a compute core for a couple of dollars, right? Um, and the problem starts to lie somewhere else. So on the networking part, I think that uh, TCP IP has a really well-deserved place uh, in, in our community on the planet. But remember, it was really designed to solve WAN area issues, right? So WAN, long flight times, it's a lossy network, it's a collaborative system, the system is not under your control, and it deals with that really well. Now, in a data center network, even if it's uh, like, you know, a large football field kind of uh, thing, you own the equipment, you manage the equipment. If something is badly behaving because it's, it's going bad, you throw it out and you replace it or you turn it off or you route around it. Um, so the data center, we can engineer this to be lossless. We know how, how to do that. Fiber Channel has done that for years. Uh, uh, InfiniBand is doing this. There's very short flight times compared to uh, the WAN area. And so to use TCP IP just to communicate within a data center is a complete overkill. It's easy, sure, but it's a complete overkill and it uses a lot of energy. Um, so I don't think that that is the way to go. Um, the further observation I'd like to make is that when we talk about the next turn of the crank in terms of the, the speeds and feeds of all of this networking, then um, I don't think that InfiniBand on its own or PCI on its own or Sonnet on its own can afford to develop a complete new PHY uh, for this standard on its own. Uh, so if I say, you know, the next lane speed is going to be uh, tens of gigabits uh, to 100 gigabits uh, per lane, uh, it has to be optical, right? There's no, no way around this. Uh, so you're talking connectors, you're talking a whole ecosystem. Um, I guarantee that uh, we as a larger community need to get together to develop that, uh, that PHY. Uh, as a common one for all of these uh, uh, communication protocols. So the industry is already well advanced on network convergence, so data center bridging, uh, formerly also known by IBM as C for convergence hands Ethernet, where the convergence of Ethernet and fiber channel is uh, well underway. There's many products that will be available or are available uh, today. and. It will address IB. Uh, things go slower than most people would have hoped, but this is something that will happen because there's tremendous savings uh, in capital expense, operational expense, both in terms of people and, and energy. So basically, I think that one of the things that we should do as a community is uh, do the next step in the convergence, because think about this. You do a very well tightly integrated server chip. Um, the largest constraint we have on those chips is a number of pins. We don't want to spend those pins with a PCI interface and an IB interface and an Ethernet interface. It's going to converge in one single thing. Um, and I think you want OFED to run over this, right? Um, and why this will happen? It's more saving in CapEx and OPEX. And Intel Lightpeak is going there right now. So if you haven't watched that space, this is really what's going on under the cover. Um, so somebody else mentioned this already uh, to morning, uh, this morning, um, so I'm sorry guys, the days of large packets will be over all too soon. So for people who are building NICs, message rates, uh, you're going to go through the roof. Do you think that a sensor is going to send 1500 bytes to give you a temperature readout? I don't think so. So the microserver trend is going to give an explosion of endpoints which really means that we need very, very large data center networks. They should be highly efficient in terms of energy, and TCP IP for data center is simply not. Uh, we must be able to support many different topologies, right? Not every workload will have the same topology needs. Uh, we need subnets, but we need virtualization. I think you want to be able to think about the subnet in a, in a very virtualized way, 
um, especially with V-Motion and those things that were discussed earlier. So we need all of the, the techniques that we've seen, so OpenFlow, Trail, Mac and Mac, uh, RDMA, lossless, uh, QoS, congestion control, adaptive routing, and there should be a, uh, a very lean transport layer to make uh, reliable delivery. And it needs to be very, very tightly integrated with uh, the memory subsystem and the server, uh, the compute cores uh, to to get the energy efficiency. So, of course, we need uh, optical because uh, to cross any distance out of uh, out of these systems, uh, that will be that will be happening. So, with this, I uh, conclude. Um, these are some of the papers that we uh, that we have submitted on all of our microserver research. Uh, this is the paper on this fundamental bound for the photonic interconnect. And for some reason, uh, Bill asked me to show two pictures, which are completely unrelated, except that this is also a disruption. This is a very lightweight plane that is going to be a huge disruption in the whole glider industry. It is so lightweight that you can actually run off a hill with this. You can actually see the guy's legs hang out of this. And then uh, he flies this like a, like a, a normal glider. So with that, do we have any questions? I have a few. Sure. Okay. So, um, do you do you honestly believe that the workloads are changing, or are we just catching up? Because you know, when you call up technologies like Twitter and YouTube, and what, I mean, this is not new. You know, this is years. This is five and seven year old technology. So, are we truly just trying to catch up? Is that, or, or do you see them changing even further? Or, or you know, another kind of. Another You're kind of waving. Okay, I'll repeat the question. Yes, so uh, so um, are we are we just catching up given the new workloads? So what you what you really have happening is that there is a new technology that comes available, like for instance all of the mobile devices that enable a new behavior of uh, customers in the marketplace, right? And this this causes a new behavior that causes a new workload. The new workload then says, oh, I have new requirements, and then I need to change the system, and then I make the system better. And then the customers discover, oh, you know, two years ago this was working really badly, and um, so I'm not using this. But it's become better now, and I, I now start to use it more. And then, then people say, oh, now I can use it for something else I wasn't thinking about. So in some sense, it's, uh, it's catching up. Uh, but it's in some sense, it's always, you know, the, the, the technology is catching up to the people's needs. And then the people's needs catch up to the new level of the technology, and it, it keeps on going, and it keeps converging, uh, as long as the economic equation is satisfied OK. So, so having said that, I suppose, then I guess the other, uh, oh, the only, the other question I have is um, with regards to the microservers and the microserver type technology, right? Um, you know, are the are the and I just because I don't know are the are the microserver technologies today based uh, alongside ECC memory and and do they really go over you know four gigabytes per server and you know and how truly does you know do those microservers play in in you know in the other workloads of concern like big data and data mining and right because I mean it, they kind of seem to be a mismatch of, of technology completely so yeah the, uh, the the companies that are driving those microserver things they are really catching up um, so there are 64-bit true 64-bit microservers things that are planned I cannot uh, disclose the name of the company because somebody will cut my head off um, and uh, there's ARM uh, parts available today that are 32-bit uh, architectures inside the core, but they can address up to 16 gigabytes of memory, so they have a way to extend the memory. Um, ECC memory, uh, today you don't find the support for this, but tomorrow you will find the support for this. This stuff is rapidly growing up. And um, today, I don't think you would want to build your data center with this. But in five years, my prediction is that in five years, the equipment, the way we put data centers together, especially when they're new data centers, is looking radically different from what we have today. 
radically different. So the other thing about big data is, you know, um, at the end of the day, the, the economics are really, really important. So if you say, I really want to have 10 petabytes of data uh, in memory, then I think the largest cost of the equipment is actually the memory. The largest power consumption of that thing is in the memory. So we're going to have something that is going to be optimized around making that happen really efficient. And we worry less about the cars, uh, about the, the cores. Right, so just put the cores in where you need them. So um, I think the optimization point will change tremendously. So yes. Can you comment about the 1,500 bytes of data or MPU, basically? So you're suggesting we should have maybe a variable MPU dependent on the device that's connected? Because there are going to be large data sets. If we move to 100 gig, I, I don't think the 9K MPU will be good for large data sets. Yeah, I, I think that you know the requirements are always uh, you know we get we get additional things. It's not like the old things will go away. So so jumbo frames are definitely something that is important uh, to get really efficient uh, RDMA transfers of large chunks of data. But that is not the only thing that's going to be sent around on the planet, right? Uh, in addition, you will have many many packets of very short message message size, and so I think the argument that um, uh, was made this morning is that we also need to focus, besides low latency, thanks to <laughs> uh, your presentation, uh, low latency and high bandwidth, we also need to support very high message rate, right? So Everything. It just gets more complex, right? Okay, thanks Ronald. Really appreciate it. Okay.